please have open uh, before you 2 Timothy uh, and chapter 1. And we're going to look very specially this morning at verses 3 and 4. Uh, so on YouTube, uh, it's available there, the recordings on the church website, our introductory message last week. And we saw, didn't we, as we've just mentioned in prayer, what a serious letter this is, what an urgent letter this is, and what a personal and deeply emotional uh, letter this is. And uh, we saw last week something about the, the background, uh, the, the geography, uh, Paul in Rome, Timothy in Ephesus, the history, uh, AD 64, sometime around there, the great fire in Rome, Christians being blamed for such things, Paul having been arrested and is in prison in Rome. And uh, we know something about the biography of these two men. In the book of Acts, we have a, uh, that laid out for us concerning the Apostle Paul and uh, dotted around the different letters as well as Acts chapter 16, we know something about Timothy. Well, I want to just add two things um, uh, before we press on uh, in by way of introduction. And the first is this, to ask the question, who is this letter intended for? And you may say, well, well, you've told us that it's for Timothy. Uh, isn't that who it's addressed to? Well, yes, that's very true, isn't it? But I wonder why the Apostle Paul begins the letter like this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Doesn't Timothy know that? Well, of course he does. I wonder why Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 tells Timothy all scripture is given by inspiration of God and we know that verse, don't we? Wouldn't Timothy know that? Timothy had been with Paul for about 15 years. So we're given a clue here about the way that letters were dealt with in those days. The letters to the churches, the letters to individuals in churches like Timothy. This letter, although addressed to Timothy, would be read out before the church in Ephesus. Now, that's interesting because that means that instead of us thinking, oh, well, this is just a, a Paul and Apostle writing to Pastor Timothy. So I'm just uh, in the congregation, as it were. Uh, it doesn't really have much to say to me. That's not true. Actually, it has something to say to all of us. And when the letter was first read, it was read out, um, out loud to all so that they could pray for Timothy and for those in leadership in the church. So it's addressed more than just to Timothy, although primarily, of course, it's a personal letter to him. And the second thing, just by way of introduction, is this. How are we going to progress through this letter? We had a, an introduction, didn't we? And it's good to introduce each book of the Bible uh, to put it into context. We mentioned Roger Crooks's book, uh, uh, which is available from the Banner of Truth, which surveys each book of the Bible. And it's good to get a bird's eye view. What's the background of each book? We saw that last week. Well, we went through the book of Acts recently, didn't we? And in the book of Acts, sometimes it's just narrative. It's just storyline, as it were. And we took quite large portions, didn't we? And applied them uh, to us uh, with God's help. But when we come to a book like this, which is so spiritually important, um, because every line, every word is important, we're going to look at it in a very different way. We're going to go through it literally line by line. So we'll progress uh, quite slowly, really, through the book if we're going to get the most from it. And this morning, we're just going to look at two verses, really. In the context of what we've seen in verses one and two, we're going to look at verses three and four. Let me just read them, and then we can press on. So verses three and four, Paul says, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. So let me ask you, how are you coping with lockdown? Another lockdown. Well, there's all sorts of issues, aren't there, with lockdown. And um, 
we've never faced anything like this before. But here we are looking at the circumstances of Paul writing to Timothy. And you know, we are connected with this situation very really, because here is Paul in what we might call the ultimate lockdown. He is locked up in prison in Rome. For him, there's no daily exercise. He can't go out for a walk this afternoon like we can do. Uh, visiting was allowed, but in a limited way. And you'll see from chapter 1 and verse 15 how although uh, some came to him, he says a lot of people have deserted him. He's very alone. There were no plans for the future, no more missionary journeys, uh, no more churches to be established. Um, there was no real future, it seemed, and a very bleak present. At least we, we're looking forwards, aren't we, and saying, well, with the vaccine, uh, we're hoping, aren't we, to be through this pandemic, maybe sometime uh, later on this year. Uh, but for Paul, he was on the sentence of death. So here's Paul called to be an apostle, he says, a messenger of Jesus Christ and of the gospel. He's locked down. It's the ultimate lockdown. But notice this, that Paul is still about his master's business. He doesn't bemoan his lot, does he? He doesn't give up. He doesn't give in to despair. He tells us that he has an incredible promise. It's there in verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise that is in Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian this morning, you are holding in your hands, in your heart, the very same promise that Paul had. It's the promise of a future. And people today are despairing. People are losing their jobs. Their businesses are closing. Their mental health is being really affected. They've got difficulties in their families and they have no promise, no hope. But if you're a Christian, you have this same promise of life that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can learn from the Apostle Paul in his ultimate lockdown. And I want to share with you from these two verses, five things, five things that you can do, because Paul certainly did them in his lockdown. And here's the first one. Just like Paul, down, you can be thanking God. Thanking God. Verse three, I thank God. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? When we've thought about the background and the situation in which Paul is in, the very first thing that he says is this, I thank God. Now, the boys and girls, the young people have got a, a sheet to complete. And one of the questions they've got to fill in is really, what was it like for Paul in a prison like this? They've got to imagine what it was like. Well, we do know many things from what he tells us, even in this letter. In chapter 1, verse 16, he says he's chained. Uh, chapter 2, verse 9, he refers to chains. We, we know it's a, in a in a back street somewhere. It's a difficult place to find. He tells us about his friend Anosiphorus, who comes in chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. Um, but he, he, he had to diligently search to find the Apostle Paul, He's tucked away somewhere. And it's cold. We know it's cold because in chapter 4 and verse 13, he writes to Timothy and he says, when you come, Timothy, please bring my cloak. And we know winter is coming. When he writes, winter is coming. Chapter 4 and verse 21, he says, do your utmost to come before winter. What's it like in winter in Rome? Well, I checked up the uh, weather forecast for Rome and uh, it's getting up to seven degrees today, probably similar to what it will be here. But last night in Rome, it was minus five degrees. Think of Paul in this prison, minus five degrees. Doesn't seem to be anyone around to comfort him. Paul, uh, sorry, Luke in chapter 4 verse 11 seems to be able to make some visits to him and he's living, it seems, in Rome at this time. 
Now, if we'd have been writing this letter, I have a sneaking suspicion we'd have put all those things, how cold it was, how lonely it was, and how difficult it was, we would have put all those things at the beginning of the letter. But the first thing that Paul does, he says, I thank God. I, I think we can see here, can't we, that Paul is thankful for his past. In the context of it, he says, I'm an apostle. Well, that had happened some years ago, chosen to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He thanks God for that, that amazing privilege of being met by the Lord Jesus Christ and commissioned by him to take out the gospel. He's thankful for his past. He's thankful for his future. He has this promise of life. Of course, he's referring to eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has that to thank God for. And he's thankful as well for the present. How do we know that? Well, he talks in verse one about the will of God. And of all theologians, the Apostle Paul is a man who extols the sovereignty of God. He, he speaks about how God is working out his purposes. All things work together for good, he says to those that love God, who are called according to his purpose. He wrote to the very to church in Rome about that in Romans 8, 28. He's thankful for his present. And here's where um, what we believe has to be worked out, isn't it? Because in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 18, the Paul, Paul writes to the Thessalonians church, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He writes, in everything give thanks. Well, the big test about what we say, what we write, is whether we live it out. And here Paul is living out his thankfulness. And if you're a Christian this morning, there's always a past, a present, and a future to be thankful for. When Paul begins his writing in his greeting, which if we said is to Timothy and to the church, he mentions three things, doesn't he? Grace, mercy, and peace. And whatever our surroundings, if you're a Christian, then those things are yours to thank God for. Grace, mercy, and peace. And today in lockdown, people know anger, frustration and bitterness but for a christian grace mercy and peace we began by singing didn't we my heart is full of thankfulness what's the second thing well paul in his ultimate lockdown was serving god not only thanking god but serving god verse three again i thank god whom I serve. And again, we have to look very carefully at all the words that Paul uses, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Here Paul is using a tense, isn't he? What is the verb tense here? It's a present tense. Not only is it a present tense, but it's a continuous present tense. In other words, what he's saying is this, I thank God whom I serve, not who I served, He's not saying in the past, not who I used to serve, but now I'm holed up here in this prison and I can't do anything. My, my, my life as an apostle is really just ground to a halt. My life as a missionary, even my sort of Christian life has just stopped here. No, what he says is this, I am serving God here and now. I, I wonder if Paul had any inkling that the letter that he's writing here is the letter that you've got. Just pick up the page. Just, just finger the page in front of you. This is the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. What incredible usefulness. We're going to spend weeks looking at this, drawing out so much spiritual application and encouragement for our hearts and our lives. You see, we shouldn't think that uh, in lockdown we're just... Well, we're holed up here. What can we do? 
No, Paul says, I thank God whom I serve. Another interesting thing is the word that Paul uses. When Paul often uses the term servant or uh, slave in, in those days, he uses the Greek word doulos. And uh, such was common in those days. A master had a slave. Some were terrible masters and the slave's uh, position was, was pretty awful. But some were good masters and, and it, was a, it was a joy to serve under such a master. And in that word, he uses that uh, on a number of occasions. And he talks about that in his own life. But here he uses a word which is a word which would be used for one who was a worker for hire. A worker for hire. A few years ago, I had something to do with uh, uh, quite a, 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 a unique church down in London, right near the Tower of London. It's called the Seaman's Rest Mission. The Seaman's Rest Mission. Well, our church is very much tied up, isn't it, with, with our railway past. Well, that mission church is tied up with its seafaring past. And I got to know the pastor there, and he told me the story about the mission and how men would come from all parts of the world in ships into the port of London. But how many people in the congregation and roundabout would be workers for hire. And what they would do, the men would go every morning, very early in the morning, and they would queue up down at the docks. They were saying, I'm here for, I'm ready for work. And they were used to unload the ships and do all the, all the manual work in those days, 100 years or so ago. They went and said, I'm ready, I'm here, hire me and I'll serve. Now that's the word that Paul is using. I thank my God whom I am ready today when I wake up to serve him, however he will use me. That's very instructive, isn't it, for us as we wake up each morning. Uh, sometimes we wake up, don't we, in this lockdown time, and uh, well, we don't know what day it is. Um, some of us who are, are not going out to work and some of you who are working from home even, I'm sure you even feel like that. But what can we do for the Lord? Well, we're to make ourselves available for him as the Apostle Paul did. He said, I'm available for hire. What was his motivation for that? What got him out of bed in his prison in the morning? Well, here's his motivation. It's the same motivation we saw on Wednesday when we were thinking about the Ten Commandments. Why should I keep the Ten Commandments? Why should, I, why should I aspire to those high ideals of uh, those commands? What, why should I queue up, as it were, to serve God uh, tomorrow morning? Well, it's gratitude, isn't it? It's love. It's the response of love. The God who has promised me grace and mercy and peace and life in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must review our blessings. And when we review our blessings, then we review our service for the Lord. We have to remember, too, how he served. No one's watching. Maybe as a Roman soldier that looks at him every day, you make sure he's still there and he's still alive. But no one's watching. There's no crowd. There's no audience. There's no one to impress. But you see what he says in verse three? He says, I serve God with a pure conscience. He's not conscious, therefore, of others, just God. And that's instructive, isn't it, for us as to how we should serve. He says, I serve God with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. What does he mean by that? Well, I think what he's doing, he's thinking there right back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, all those of the past who were men of faith, like those who are in Hebrews chapter 11, who, seeing him who is invisible, served him, not conscious of those visible and, and sadly, as Christians, often what we do, we find ourselves serving God, but we just want people to notice us and we want people around to see us. Maybe, therefore, lockdown is teaching us a lesson, the lesson of serving God with our conscience clear that we're doing that with only him watching. 
1521, that's 500 years ago. It's the anniversary of what we call the Diet of Worms. Um, and that time when Martin Luther was uh, put on trial, as it were, and made that great statement uh, that uh, he's reputed to have made. Here I stand, I can do no other. And after that time, um, as he uh, rode away on his horse from the city of Worms, he was a marked man. But he had a friend, Frederick, the Elector of Saxony, who arranged for him to be captured and arrested for his own good. And he took him to the Wartburg Castle and he was locked down. He was locked up, locked in a room. You can go to that place, you can go to that castle, you can go to the room and see where he was kept. What did he do? Did he wring his hands and say, well, everything I've just stood for and stood up for, it's all a waste? can't do anything now. No, he set to and he translated the New Testament of the Bible into the common German at that time. So in lockdown, we are to be those who are thankful to God and to serve him, to make ourselves available to him, ready for his hire, ready to work. Of course, it requires some thought. Um, not easy, is it, to know what, what can we do? Maybe if we're in WIPAC or if we're in Sunday school or something like that, I think of my work in the schools, the work would be in the diary. And, and you do it because it was there, but we're having to think carefully now, what can we do? Well, Paul thought that. I thank my God whom I serve not just in the past, but today. Here's the third thing. Paul in his ultimate lockdown is a challenge to us because of his praying for others, praying for others, thanking God, serving God, praying for others. Look at verse three again, as it goes on. It says, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers day and night. Now, I think in lockdown that our default position is inward. Uh, for many of us, it's uh, the predicament that I'm in, the difficulties that this lockdown presents, uh, the troubles uh, within and without, and really our prayers, therefore, are almost I pray without ceasing about my particular problems and difficulties. But Paul says, I pray without ceasing, Timothy, for you, praying for others. And I think it follows that we will not do that unless, first of all, we are thanking God, recognizing his many blessings and seeking to serve God, serving him. Then we find ourselves praying for others. It is their needs and not ours that become paramount. It's interesting, again, word by word almost here, we're progressing the word for prayers. Well, there's various words for prayer and prayers in the Greek and in the New Testament. Well, this is a word which refers to need and the, the need that is met by Someone calling upon God for the needs of others. We call it supplication. It's coming to God on behalf of others. It's entreaty. It's calling upon God for others. And that's what Paul was doing. I'm sure he prayed for himself. I am sure he did. But here the picture of him is this. A man thankful, a man serving, but a man praying for others. So if that's a challenge for us, the first thing that we need to do, surely, is to know what the needs are of others. We know our own needs. What are the needs of others? Without that knowledge, how can we pray? And that requires us to have contact, to have connection, to have interest, to have awareness, to know what's going on with others. 
Some commentators think that Paul might well have received a letter from Timothy, which we don't have, which he's responding to. Some think that Onesiphorus or, or another visitor told Paul about uh, Timothy and therefore he's up to date with him. But we've got to work, haven't we, to find out what's what's happening with others uh, in the church. It requires us to use those those modern means that we have to use our texts and our WhatsApps and our on our emails and our phones and so on to say, hi, how are you doing? To know. I'm sure pretty well every one of us, uh, we did it as a church, didn't we, at, at, at New Year time have been involved in a scavenger hunt on Zoom. Zoom scavenger hunt, that's the big thing. Well, if I said to you, uh, okay, scavenger hunt, question number one, uh, go and get me the church prayer card. Here it is. Would you be able to get it that quick? Or would you go, oh, crumbs, I don't know where it is. Um, it's here somewhere. It's a, oh, boy, oh, boy, I don't know. Is it upstairs? Is it downstairs? I think it would probably show us just how much we are interested and care for others and are going to pray for others. And, you know, when we come to the church prayer meeting on a Wednesday, it has been such a wonderful meeting for us all throughout lockdown. Not only that we can pray, but that we can hear the prayers of others that informs us and helps us to know the needs which we can then pray for. We're in lockdown. We don't see each other like we normally do. But in hearing others pray, we're prompted to pray, aren't we? And one more thing about this. What about telling? Telling others. We're a bit reticent, aren't we? We're sort of British, as it were. Some of us are from different countries and are more perhaps outward going. Some from other countries are even more reserved than we are. But if you don't tell me what you're weeping about, how can I weep with you? If you can't tell me and don't tell me what your joys are, how can I rejoice with you? And there's a responsibility upon us all, really, to be telling others so that others might pray for us. Now, of course, we don't tell each other every little detail of all our lives all the time. But there are those who have been through interviews recently those who have been on long journeys, those who have been in hospital and other things. And, and it's so good when you tell us that so that we might pray for you. And then notice this. Paul says that he prays for Timothy without ceasing and day and night. Now, don't think for a minute that the Apostle Paul does absolutely nothing at all other than just pray and pray and pray and pray day and night. For Timothy. No, no, no. What he's saying, of course, is that um, it isn't just the odd prayer that he prays, but when he sets to to pray, he always remembers Timothy without ceasing. He's not, he's not going to stop. It's not like a one-off prayer. Sometimes we're quite guilty of that, aren't we? A need is uh, told to us, a prayer meeting or on the sea news or whatever, and what we do is we pray very passionately for that need and then we just forget it. But Paul is a man praying without ceasing, and he's praying day and night. I think what he means there is this, that at the end of the day, or at the beginning of the day, he prays, and he prays for Timothy, mentions him in his prayers. And at the end of the night, at the beginning of the night, there's a routine, there's a, there's a regularity about the prayers of the Apostle Paul for Timothy. There's so many needs so much need to pray. Number four, Paul challenges is Paul challenges us in our lockdown by his desiring, or, or in some versions it says his longing, his longing for fellowship. We're into verse four. Paul says, greatly desiring to see you. Greatly desiring to see you. You know, what runs through to Timothy is, is just how much Paul values and longs for real face-to-face -face connection and fellowship with Timothy and with others too. 
and how much he laments the fact that lockdown for him has broken that chain of regular fellowship. Paul, of all men, was a people person, wasn't he? Always thinking about people, always connected with people, always interacting with people, day after day in the synagogue, out in the streets, in people's homes, walking along, on ships, people, people, people. He missed that so much. He greatly desired Timothy's fellowship. And that word greatly, it is, it is really an intense word. So Paul doesn't write as we do sometimes in a letter, uh, pop in and see us sometime. And really, we're not sort of too fussed whether they do or not. No, Paul so much longs to see Timothy. If you scour to Timothy, you will find that uh, Timothy's name included, there are 23 names of different people here in this letter. Most of them are in chapter four, but they're spread throughout. Onesiphorus, he refreshed the Apostle Paul, chapter 1, verse 16. Alexander, he did harm to the Apostle Paul, chapter 4, verse 14. Demas, he deserted the Apostle Paul, chapter 4 and verse 10. In chapter 4 and verse 21, Paul does a catch-all, as it were, and speaks about all the brethren. He sees other Christians as brothers and sisters, and of course, he sees Timothy as his son. He longs to see his son in the faith, Timothy. But there are so many brethren. There are so many who are connected to him because they are one in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. And I wonder if we really value one another in this way. I think lockdown is teaching us a lot of things. Right at the beginning of lockdown, I wrote a, a little article about what is lockdown teaching us. We could perhaps revisit that and say, in a longer term, what has it been teaching us? I know the ladies are going to think about that on Saturday morning and share together what lockdown has been teaching them. But here is Paul locked down in the ultimate lockdown. And one of the things that comes out is how much he values Christian fellowship and friendship and longs for it. So some of you have got Fitbits, you know, like a watch, the Fitbit tells you how many paces you've done and your heart rate and all that sort of thing. So let's have a look at our spiritual Fitbit, because in 1 John, one of the tests of our true faith, true Christianity, and one of the tests of the level, as it were, of our assurance of salvation is how much we love the brethren. So just check your Fitbit for a moment and see where the dial is. Is the dial round to where it says, loving my own company, loving my own stuff, my own hobbies, watching my own little TV programs stuck here at home? I'm actually quite loving it. Well, there's nothing wrong with those things. But our Fitbit dial really should be where Paul's is, longing for fellowship real fellowship. Why is that? Well, two things. They're a mirror image of one another. Can you see what he says? That he's longing for this fellowship, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. He feels that he can do such good to Timothy. If you could see Timothy, uh, at, he could help him. Writing this letter uh, is there to help him. The rest of the content of the letter tells us how much he desired to benefit and profit Timothy, even if he couldn't see him. But what if he could see him? But on the flip side, on the other side, can you see what it says in verse four? That I may be filled with joy. He knows that if Timothy was to come, if he could spend time with him, he, Paul, would be filled with joy. Now, that's not a bad thing, is it, to be filled with joy in fellowship in the gospel. And remember that friendship and fellowship is a means of grace. Preaching is a means of grace. Prayer is a means of grace. The communion table is a means of grace. Baptism 
is a means of grace, but fellowship is a means of grace, a means where God imparts his grace and his blessing to us. Joy, what a joy it would be if he could see Timothy. How he longed for, desired Timothy's presence, fellowship. Well, here's the last thing. Fifthly, we see Paul in his lockdown caring for those in need. Caring for those in need. We touched on it really in verse four, where Paul says, being mindful of your tears. Now, we should take note, shouldn't we, when grown men cry. Some of us are quite emotional people, but when grown men cry, we see that the best of men weep when they care. The best of men weep when they care. We find Timothy weeping. He was one of the best of men, wasn't he? Paul weeps. The Lord Jesus weeps. When do we find them weeping? When there's need when they care jesus oh jerusalem jerusalem when he comes to the grave of lazarus jesus wept caring timothy why did he weep timothy well it was that parting from the apostle paul had been such a a blessing to him as a spiritual father and timothy remembered those tears and uh, and Paul remembered those tears of Timothy. And, and now he knows that Timothy is under severe pressure. Just, just look with me. Chapter 1, verse 8, he says, do not be ashamed. Chapter 1, verse 13, he says, hold fast. Chapter 2, verse 1, our church text, be strong. Chapter 2, verse 13, be diligent. Chapter 4, verse 2, be ready. Why is Paul using all those imperatives they're all related to battle, to conflict, to war, to trouble. Timothy is under severe pressure in the society and situation in which he's in. And Paul cares deeply for him in that situation. Now, the world around Timothy was closing in and the world around us is closing in. If you receive the Christian Institute uh, literature regularly, you'll see how fast the world is closing in on us. And it will be difficult to be a Christian in the days that come. That's why, young people, we pray for you so much. We love you so much. We long for you to become Christians because we want you um, with all our hearts to be built up now while you're young with knowledge and understanding and the strength of grace so that you might be able, like Timothy, to stand in the perilous days that are coming. You might get a bit embarrassed, young people, children. Oh, you're always praying for me. You're always mentioning the children and the young people. Do you know why? Because we care for you. And Paul cared for Timothy. So in 2 Timothy 2, Verses one, two and three. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses uh, who will be able to teach others. Uh, pass these things on. Timothy, I care for you. But I not only care for you, but I care for the future of the gospel. And I care for you because you're going to be holding the baton, which I'm going to be passing on to you. And then you're going to be passing it on down the line. And young people, the reason we care for you so much. It's because we can see that you're going to be holding the truths that we hold so dear in the future. And will you be holding them dearly and passing them on down in the future? The future leadership of the church in Ephesus is in the hands of a man 30 years younger than the Apostle Paul. This young man, Timothy, he's a totally different character to the Apostle Paul. We know he has some physical difficulties and he has some character difficulties. We don't dwell on those. It doesn't make him sort of abnormal or odd because we all have weaknesses and difficulties. But Paul is concerned that this young man might be helped and encouraged through his friendship and fellowship and teaching. He cared very deeply for him. So out there amongst those 
uh, those of us who are grown up, those of us who are adults in the church um, out there, do you have on your heart those who you care for? The younger ones in our fellowship, do you care for them? Are you ready to help them? There are some who are recently converted. What are the best books that you can give them and buy for them? What are the best websites you can point them to? How can you help them through contact with them and, and strengthening them, helping them? And we realize how old we're getting, don't we, some of us? And we realize that it seems that most people are younger than us. Our responsibility, like Paul, is to care for the Timothys for the future. When I was very young, um, I went to uh, the church um, in Leicester, uh, which I eventually became a member of when I became saved, um, a few times because I was part of the Boys Brigade. And we used to have to go to Boys Brigade parade services. And I, I remember the man who was the minister then in those days was a man called Leslie Land. Leslie Land was the minister there from 1947 to 1961. He was quite an austere man. He didn't preach in an open neck shirt. He preached in a, in a suit with a gown on. It was a serious business to hear God's word from Leslie Land's preaching. But when he was a very frail old man in 1986, he lay in a nursing home room on his own. And there was a young nurse who used to come in and tend him and care for him because that was her job as, as a nurse to do that. But you see, this man, Leslie Land, he cared. He cared for her. He was locked. He was locked down. He was in a hospital bed, in a nursing home bed. He couldn't even get out of the bed. He was very frail. But what he did was this. He asked this young nurse every day when she came in to read the Bible to him. Now, that would be a blessing to him. But he knew this. He knew the power of God's word. He knew that God's word could do something wonderful for that girl. And it did. And through his prayers and through his care for that girl, she became a Christian just by reading the Bible to Leslie Land in the last weeks of his life. We had the privilege, a number of us, you will remember, uh, that girl came on our church house party some years ago. It'd be wrong for me to mention names, but uh, you will know of her. What a blessing that is. What a wonderful thing. And here is Paul in his lockdown, caring. And there was Leslie Land, locked down, as it were, in his bed, caring. So as we come to a close this morning, Paul's letter is amazing, really. It is quite incredible, isn't it? It's a letter of care and concern and love to Timothy from Paul. Wouldn't you have expected the letter to be the other way round? Wouldn't you have expected the letter to be from Timothy in his freedom over there in Ephesus with his concern for Paul, dear Paul? But here we have a letter of the caring man in lockdown. What a lesson for you and I. Are we caring men and women in lockdown? So here in these two verses, just two verses, 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 and 4, here is the ultimate in lockdown Christianity. Just jot them down. Thanking God, serving God, praying for others, desiring fellowship, and caring for those in need. And where's the motivation for that? The motivation is in the first two verses. Because we have the promise of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever happens, eternity, heaven is ours. Whatever happens with the vaccine, whatever happens with lockdown, whatever happens with our jobs, with our future, 
we have the promise of life in Christ Jesus. And we have these great, wonderful gifts from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in abundance, grace, mercy, and peace. There's the motivation, thankfulness for such blessings. Let's pray. Lord, teach us, we pray, from your word that we may not only know these things in our minds, not only feel them, Lord, in our hearts, because we long that we might feel them, but that we might live them out in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.